Jacob Frankel, to say he is with J.P. Morgan uh, Chase International, barely describes his capabilities, and particularly uh, Dr. Frankel's synthesis of foreign exchange with our macroeconomics and now our fiscal economics as well. Dr. Frankel, should our viewers be concerned about the new deficits and the chronic new large deficits of the United States? Of course. The important issue is to recognize that as the United States is focusing on how to <clears throat> reduce their current account deficit, and the focus is on China, at the very same time, the increased budget deficit operates to the opposite direction. Because at the end of the day, other things equal, any dollar rise in the budget deficit is reflecting itself in the current account which tells us again a more general issue. The current account is a multilateral issue, and therefore the focus on China as a bilateral issue is not fitting that framework. I look at this, Simon Kennedy, with your wonderful summation of Maurice Opsfeld's work with the Economic Outlook. He drives that forward with an op-ed in the FT today, which is basically, Simon, a primer on trade deficit, trade surplus economics. Is anybody at the White House reading Maurice Hobsfeld? Uh, well, I'm sure they are at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, there's an interesting uh, back and forth over the last few days in Washington between Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, and the IMF about just what the IMF should be, uh, be looking at and uh, the IMF telling the U.S. that uh, they need to kind of work, as, as Jacob just said, through a kind of a multilateral way, and, uh, and the U.S. firing back that the... Uh, IMF needs to step up. It was a kind of a weekend in which uh, everyone was trying to find allies for this, uh, yeah. this discussion and, uh, and lots of outreach in the corridors. Um, Dr. Frankel, when you look at, at the IMF, what was, I mean, the overall feeling was exactly this, right? People were kind of angling to, to know how they could counter any protectionist measures. But will it die down in the end? Will we see kind of, you know, the cool heads of globalization or at least economy prevail or could, could it get messy? Well, I would hope they will prevail, because normally, under normal circumstances, if I just showed you the numbers, growth is good, economic performance reasonably well, labor markets operate well, even inflation moves towards the target, and people are worried. And why? The main reason today is the dangers from protectionism. Not only because protectionism is a bad thing, not only because of the fact that in an interconnected world protectionism means let's cut the veins and it's dangerous, but also a new element came in the discussion, which is investors are now slowing down. They say there is a lot of uncertainty. How will it resolve? So beyond the trade, it is uncertainty that holds investment. And without investment, we will not have growth. And what we see now may be temporary. So I really hope that all of this is reflections of some negotiating tactics rather than a strategy of cutting the veins. I mean, it certainly seems that all the, the finance ministers and central bankers that we spoke to were so acutely aware of this concern that, that they would try and maybe mitigate some of the effects. Is there anything in their power that they can do to try and get chief executives to reinvest? Well, certainly um, one of the things Christine Lagarde was talking about at the weekend, again, was this fixing the roof while it's raining and, and doing more to uh, improve the, uh, the kind of un underpinnings of economies, so to speak. I think it'd be I think what things executives and investors would help uh, would help is perhaps fewer uh, fewer tweets <coughs> from uh, leading uh, international policymakers. That's one thing that would uh, kind of provide some certainty. Um, a lot of confusion last week about uh, from tweets from the president of the United States about uh, OPEC, about currency devaluations in China and and Russia and accusations that ne don't necessarily add up when you look at other things. And so some pressure there, uh, kind of on the U.S. Well, administration, for some well. for some clarity. Simon, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's get some reality from the former governor of the Bank of Israel. Jacob Frankel, were you ever tweeting as governor of the Bank of Israel? Well, uh, let me answer in a more positive way. By the way, when I was governor, the word tweeting was uh, reserved only for birds. Mm. So uh, when uh, the issue of communication is the real matter, clarity of communication, transparency, and, communi and dialogue with the markets and with policymakers. In this regard, the statement that said that uh, Secretary Mnuchin is planning uh, to uh, fly over to China to renew communications is, for me, very good news, and I hope that it indeed it will be uh, 
it will be implemented. Because let's face it, it is not in the interest of neither China nor the United States to get into this slippery slope. But the issue is that each one may come to the table with a different strategy. One has the tactics and one has the strategy. For the United States, the essential element is how to deal with the uh, property rights of intellectual property rights, especially in the technology area. For China, they want really to expand into the world more and more. They think about 2025, we think about the way towards 2025, and I think that many wars in history started for due to miscommunication. We should really avoid it at all costs. The stakes are very high. Jacob Frankel, since uh, Tom Keen brought up the Bank of Israel, uh, do you think the current governor will get another term and local media reporting that you're a candidate for the job, are you? I will only refer to your first question, which is, uh, uh, I hope she will get another term. She is doing a very good job, but I will also help you with the second issue. I'm not a candidate for anything. All right, we'll get back uh, to that uh, very shortly. Thank you so much. Jacob Frankel there of JP Morgan. Simon, overall, just because you lead this, you know, the coverage and have been doing so for many years, how difficult is it for traders to understand the Fed because there's so many new people that, that are coming on? Is there a danger that communication uh, is a little bit more wobbly than usual? Perhaps so, but uh, when you look at the, the people Donald Trump is putting in into the Fed, um, he's, he's picking mainstream candidates, quite interesting on the Fed, maybe different from the Supreme Court, maybe different from the rhetoric of, on the campaign trail, which is perhaps more critical of the Fed than he's backed up with his nominations. People like Rich Clarida, people like Jerome Powell, a fairly mainstream economist. And when you look at the debate within the Fed, it is really, you know, do they do three times in 2018 or four times? It's not a huge uh, a kind of extremes as we've seen perhaps in central banks in the past. Um, but the, the economists and, and traders are doing exactly what they should be, which is trying to divine that path. And, and it requires them, and we've seen some situations in the UK and the ECB over the last couple of weeks with kind of recalibrating of expectations. Okay. It's ultimately for the job of the markets and the investors and the traders to work out what they think the path is and then uh, try and uh, see if the Fed matches that path. It's not for them to try and bully the Fed into a, a certain path. But the, the path isn't, it could go three more times, could go two more times. It's not that bigger path, really. Right, but is, is there, is that right, uh, Jacob Frankel? I mean, the, the path, you know, is it a narrow path or is there a danger that actually the U.S. overheats and, and therefore that would definitely kind of, you know, change market perspective? Well, it's extremely important. First of all, I agree with Simon on the general perspective. Namely, if we are, talk, if we are talking about forecasts, it's very reasonable that we will have about three more steps this year. If it is three or four or two, it becomes secondary. And similarly for next year, because we are so far away from the historical uh, average. And to me, it's not something that frightens me. As a matter of fact, uh, the US economy is robust now, has recovered, and the US, therefore, has to lead the way in the normalization. What is important to note, however, is that Federal Reserve normally deals with the short end of the market. <clears throat> That's where it is. The yield curve is the thing that connects the short end with the long end. The long end is not determined by the Fed and probably in normal times should not be determined by the Fed. It is the budget deficit, it is the growth, it is the uncertainty in the economic system and the like. And therefore, it's, it's time to realize that it's not the center stage anymore. It's not the only game in town anymore. The Fed, normalization means the Fed gets back to the narrow corner right. where it belongs, setting the short term and let the market do the medium term and the long term. Dr. Frankel, let's go back to the classroom in Chicago. We need a lesson now on what a weak dollar means to Chairman Powell. This is BBDXY. This is actually really good math on a weak dollar from the end of 2016, and down we go. Dr. Frankel, explain to our audience worldwide how a weak dollar assists the Fed as rates move higher. Well, you see, a weak dollar or nominal exchange rate has two characteristics. First, it has a nominal effect and thereby on the price index and the things that the Federal Reserve is looking at. In addition, in the short term, it also affects competitiveness, what we call the real <coughs> exchange rate. And this affects real economic activities, but only in the short term. By and large, 
the Fed should focus on the nominal exchange rate developments to the extent that they affect the price developments into the future. I should say that uh, we have had some confusion during the past few years. You recall in the old days during President Nixon's time when uh, uh, Secretary Connolly said the dollar is our currency and your problem, that's the way he approaches the European. Thereafter, a sequence of Secretary of Treasury spoke about the importance of a strong currency for the United States. And then recently in Davos, Secretary Mnuchin mentioned something that a weak dollar may be good. Yeah. I think that the whole issue is that the objective of the Federal Reserve should switch away from the dollar towards price inflation, price targets, price stability and the like. The dollar is a result, a reflection, is the thermometer of what it right. does rather than the objective of economic policy. Jacob Frankel, very quickly here, what a remarkable thing to have the leader of France, the leader of Germany, both attending Washington, uh, I, literally in the same week, really quite extraordinary. What should be their message to Mr. Trump on trade? Number one, we are here together because we are in a multilateral setting. Please, don't set your economic policy aimed at bilateral. Second, there are unintended consequences. If you aim at China, remember that the EU is an important part of the economic system, exempt us. Third, if you aim at China, remember that the value chain is very complex, so if you hit China, you also hit your own allies whose products are inputs into the products of China, like South Korea, like Taiwan, like Japan. Bottom line, communicate, don't shoot. Go ahead, send your Secretary Mnuchin, let's defuse that issue. We are all in it together and let's deal with it in, a, in, a, in this togetherness of multilateral setting. The markets will see this as a big boost because the markets know that we are in a multilateral system. The markets worry <coughs> when policies are done with a bilateral uh, eye. And therefore, it will be the best message to the market, not only because they will realize that protectionism is now recognized by the authorities to be a bad policy instrument, but also that it will, will reflect a broader issue. Because the geopolitical setting today, it's not only North Korea, it is so many areas of the world require a multilateral approach. And if you break the multilateral rules for one part, you also prejudice the ability right. to use multilateralism in well, another part of the setting. Dr. Frankel, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate this morning.